And now, Mark Wright from Q13 Fox Evening News is here to introduce and moderate today's program. Mark. Thank you, Nancy. President Bill, uh, fellow Rotarians, distinguished guests, it's my pleasure to be up here today. As I was driving here today, I, I had a flashback. As a young reporter in Spokane, I had the occasion to interview former, then former Governor Dixie Lee Ray. And I was a bit intimidated because she, of course, had a notorious reputation and a very strong personality. And I was a kid right out of college. She said, young man, there are three offices in the United States that after the person serves their term, you still refer to them by their title. Senator, Governor, President. Remember that, okay? I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm really relieved that we have a sitting senator here today so I don't have to worry about that. Okay, uh, I'm going to let the senator talk about her accomplishments, and, and I thought that I would just assemble a few nuts and bolts things uh, that I didn't know, some of them, uh, about Senator Cantwell. So, so sort of just the facts. Let's begin at the beginning. Senator Maria Cantwell was born in Indianapolis. She was exposed to politics at a very early age. Her father, Paul, served on city and county councils, was a state legislator, and was also the chief of staff for a member of Congress. Senator Cantwell got her B.A. from Miami University in Ohio in public administration. Okay, how did she get to Washington? She came to Washington State in 1983 to campaign for Alan Cranston, a Democratic presidential hopeful in the 84 election. After that, Cantwell decided to move here, settling in Mount Lake Terrace because it reminded her of Indianapolis. <laughs> See, <laughs> I wasn't anticipating that to be a joke. <laughs> So that was a bonus laugh. Thank you. <laughs> she was an early member of the Mount Lake Terrace Rotary Club, which uh, so she has a rotary history. Now, just two years after that, Cantwell herself was a candidate, winning election uh, in the Washington State Legislature at the ripe old age of 28. In 1992, Cantwell won election to the U.S. House, the first Democrat to be elected in the first district in more than 40 years. Now, she lost that seat in the Republican landslide of 1994, decided to go into the private sector as a vice president of marketing for Real Networks. There, she did well. Okay, I was anticipating that one. Fast forward to 2000, Cantwell defeated Republican Slade Gordon for the seat she currently holds. Her opponent, Republican Mike McGavick, spoke to our club in early August. Please help me give a warm rotary welcome to U.S. Senator Maria Cantwell. Well, thank you, Mark, very much for that uh, unique introduction. I would have <laughs> never have guessed that uh, Indianapolis would have gotten in Montlake Terrace a bigger laugh than my time at Real Networks. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much to uh, Seattle Rotary for having this forum and inviting me to be here. I almost feel like I should pay a, a fine or penalty for coming so close to the election. But uh, as Mark said, I think my opponent was here earlier in August, and we weren't able to be here. Uh, until now, so I very much appreciate the opportunity. And I should say we had a great debate in the uh, Spokane area at the Spokane Rotary Club, which provided a great moment of levity when KXLY, uh, right before we go to live to camera, because this was all taped and broadcast live in Spokane, the Rotary bell was right here on the podium, and right before the cameras were to go up, the then the anchor of the evening news said, I think I'll move this bell. And everybody in the audience yelled, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so the rotary bell was prominent. And if you watch that broadcast, because it's on C-SPAN now, uh, you'll see very prominent Rotarians participating in our political process. So thank you very much for that. And as Mark said, I was a, a founding member of what was the Alderwood Rotary, still exists today, uh, meets at Stevens Hospital. and. Uh, was at a time when women were first allowed into the Rotary Club, so we had a great time of being part of that organization and certainly appreciate everything that this organization does here. The fact that you're one of the largest clubs in the country, the fact that you are so generous for all the projects you support, and the fact that Rotary continues to be a beacon for the giving and eradication of polio is just tremendous, so I'm very proud to be here today. Uh, you know, I, I often speak about Washington State versus that other place, the other Washington that I have to go to. 
uh, it reminds me of a uh, story about how God disappeared for seven days. And while God was gone, Michael the archangel said, God, where have you been? And God said, well, I've been creating the great planet Earth, and it's a wonderful place of balance. And Michael the Archangel said, balance. And God said, yes, over here I'm going to put a very hot continent, and over there a very cold continent. Over here is going to be very hilly, and over there is going to be very flat. Everything is going to be in balance. And so Michael the Archangel said, well, what's, what's that there? And God said, oh, that's the great state of Washington. <laughs> it's the most beautiful place on the planet. It has Mount Rainier and Puget Sound, but it has the brightest, most energetic, get-it-done people on the planet. They really make things happen. And so Michael the Archer said, well, I thought you said Earth was a great place of balance. And God said, yeah, wait till you see what I put in the other Washington. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's just my way of saying I'm glad to be here <laughs> and glad to be home in Washington State and certainly appreciate the bright ingenuity that our state represents, and I'm proud to represent it in the other Washington and to try to convey that spirit and that value in our nation's capital. I thought I'd today talk about something that's near and dear to my heart and something that I try to communicate to the people of Washington State, and that is just the importance of us as a country getting an energy strategy for the 21st century. You've probably heard a lot about this debate about ANWR, or whether we should drill in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, and there is a lot of discussion about that, and I know there are people here who are uh, people who do business in both states. But really the issue for me, since God only gave the United States 3% of the world's oil reserves, that's it. We are not going to drill our way to energy independence. And so to me the issue is what can we do as a nation to transfer off our over-dependence on oil and onto new technology that not only can help us environmentally and economically, but can also help us internationally with our foreign policy. That's why I've worked so hard to try to communicate those issues and opportunities. And right here in Washington State, we are at the epicenter of this opportunity. Now, you might say it's that history of hydropower, that history of a state that has become 70% reliant on a hydro system and cheap, affordable electricity got us to the point of knowing how valuable a uh, hydro economy was to building an economy where business would, would locate because there was affordable electricity. Now, obviously, we became very challenged by that in 2001 when we had the second worst drought in the history of our state. And it just so happened that the deregulation of the energy markets in Enron came into the picture, and then we ended up having the highest rates in the nation and having the most impact. Now, I always, um, I always thank Norm Dix for this assignment that I now have, because when I first got to Washington, D.C., after that very close election, I hadn't even been into the nation's capital five minutes and someone said senator the phone's for you and I said well I just got here how could the phone be for me no one even knows I'm here and somebody said well it's congressman Dix he wants to talk to you and sure enough I picked up the phone and Norm was on the other end Maria you have to get on the energy committee and I said Norm how did you even know I was here and he said never mind this is the first test and if you don't get on this committee Scoop Jackson's gonna roll over in his grave <laughs> so <laughs> So that was my introduction in the midst of the 2001 energy crisis, getting on the energy committee and finding out how challenging energy policy was going to be for our nation and certainly for the Northwest. And so it focused me on what were the policies and practices that got us into the current situation, but really how could we promise to the next generation of Americans we were going to do better by our energy policies moving forward. So I've tried to focus on those opportunities that I think will help us. The Rocky Mountain Institute is a leading think tank organization on energy policy. They have come out with an analysis that has said that if the United States would focus in two areas, that is lightweight materials and alternative fuels, we could reduce our dependence on oil by 40% over the next 20 years. Now why is this so important? The fact that right now we're 50% dependent on foreign oil, we're 50% dependent on countries like Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, countries we don't really want to be dependent upon, and we're on a trajectory to be 60% dependent on foreign oil. So unless we change that course, we are going to continually depend on the activities and the environments of what aren't company businesses, they are really state-owned businesses owned by those countries and obviously influenced by those countries. 
So that's why we started first with partnering with the Boeing company and building a new FAA center at the University of Washington in composite research and composite materials and a new training program at Edmonds Community College and the University of Washington in material sciences. Now, composites are a great and exciting opportunity because they have, in that 787 plane, taken Boeing from a challenge by Airbus, who's figured out how to finance cheaper planes, not necessarily make cheaper planes, but just finance cheaper planes, and put us back into a competitive edge by building a plane that is 30% more fuel efficient. 30%. And it's 30% more fuel efficient because it's built with these lightweight composite materials that Boeing has now taken an airplane that was before the 787 only 15% composite materials and figured out how to make 60% of the airplane out of that lightweight material and thus getting that 30% efficiency and changing the ball game as it relates to aerospace and moving forward with a competitive edge. So my hat's off to Boeing for their great ingenuity in this area and for being a leader in composite materials. But we also are working hard on a clean edge strategy in our nation's capital to try to move over more jobs into clean energy technology. And um, uh, General Collins, maybe we can get some of the military who have great technology backgrounds from the military to be part of this and to be part of this effort. Now, I like to tell my um, colleagues back in Washington, D.C., that in Washington State, we have wind power, we have solar power. Nobody believes that we have solar power. <laughs> I keep telling them we have solar power <laughs> when we have wave power. Uh, I was reminded by some people the other day we actually even have fish power. Our fishermen use the fish to uh, power some of their fishing vessels, and we really have the ingenuity of American brain power at work here in the Northwest to try to help move our companies forward. In fact, we have uh, in the Northwest some of the uh, greatest assets in what I would call a smart energy enterprise. That is, there are 225 uh, different enterprises here in Washington State that have about $2 billion worth of a share of what is right now a $15 billion industry in smart technology. They're really trying to marry up what we know here in digital communications, in software, in efficiency, and in flexibility to the system uh, that we have in technology and energy. I, I always like to say it's, it's similar to the World Wide Web and the fact that it's a distributed network. We want to go, or uh, the women here, maybe, maybe the men too, I'd like to leave my house in the morning and say, turn on the dishwasher at the lowest megawatt rate today and thereby get efficiencies out of the electricity grid. That's not that far off. That's not that far off. There are companies here with both Puget Sound Energy and over in Spokane at ITRON who are making that technology to get double-digit savings out of the current electricity that's being produced by using it more efficiently. And those companies are right here in Washington State. Now, we also have companies that are working on things such as wind generation. And as I mentioned, wind is a huge opportunity for us in Washington State uh, because if you've been to eastern Washington, you see we have a lot of wind. <laughs> and you see that those projects can be not only job creation and economic revenue, we actually need the generation here in Puget Sound. That is, Columbia County near Dayton is probably uh, one of the... Uh, most challenged economic areas of our state, and last year the expansion of wind generation farms there will give that county a million dollars in tax revenue just from wind generation. In Kittitas County, they have a major wind farm going there called Wild Horse that will have enough supply to power about 70,000 homes here in Puget Sound. So they are adding capacity that we need here in Washington State, and the impacts of that are that not only do they create jobs locally and create that revenue, but they also help us gain an expertise in wind generation and technology. I'm excited about that because I want the United States to be energy leaders, not energy laggards. I want to look at this technology opportunity and say, what is the United States going to be the key leader in as opposed to Japan, who right now leads the way in fuel efficiency of automobiles. China actually has a higher energy renewable portfolio standard than we do 
in the United States. And some of the Scandinavian countries are leaders in energy technology, particularly in the wind area, where we're still playing catch up. So how do we do this? One of the things that I believe that we need to do in this country is change the incentive process that we currently in the United States Senate in our policies promote. That is that we are continuing to promote fossil fuels. The fossil fuel industry gets about $13 billion every five years for what are incentives for the uh, production of, of oil and natural gas. Whereas the wind, solar, renewable technologies are only about two-year investment strategies, two or three-year investment strategies, and so they're newer. We need to shift some of that investment that's been there for a very mature industry, like the fossil fuel industry, and shift it over to these new emerging technologies that can produce more jobs and more job opportunities for us here in the Northwest. The other thing that we need to do is what the Rocky Mountain Institute said, was, which is get on this opportunity to produce alternative fuel to look at the market of what is called ethanol and biodiesel as an opportunity. Now, does anybody here drive a, an ethanol or biodiesel car? Anybody in the audience? Not one. Or way in the back. <laughs> Washington State right now has military vehicles, school buses, public buses, probably more cars per capita than any other place in the country using alternative fuel like biodiesel. Now this is a great opportunity because if you think about what our natural resources are in the Northwest, that is the product that we could grow here to produce the fuel like wheat straw uh, or other products, we could be paying the Washington farmer instead of the Saudi OPEC cartel for our future energy needs. And this is a great opportunity. In fact, I'm very excited that this week we will be going down to Grace Harbor to look at the announcement of what is a 100 million gallon biodiesel facility that's going to be located in what has been a timber challenged community and where the aspect of new jobs is an exciting proposition. The fact that in the entire United States there wasn't 100 million gallons of biodiesel produced last year and next year Washington State is going to have that facility and produce 100 million gallons is the opportunity, again, for us to be energy leaders. Now, I always like to compare this to Brazil, which is a very interesting country. Brazil, in basically a couple of decades, has gone from being 70% dependent on foreign oil to today being energy independent. Now, how did they do that? I always like to say, you know, the Brazilians are smart, energetic people, but they, they, we have to be able to compete with that. They definitely throw some good parties down in Brazil, but you know what? <laughs> American ingenuity can top that effort. And the fact that they created a mandate to say that all new cars sold in Brazil had to be cars that were flex fuel cars, that is cars that ran on either ethanol or gasoline. Now, that seems like a pretty simple proposition. You think, well, that must be some heck of a car that can run on either of those fuels. Well, it was... Amer they're American cars made by GM and Ford sold in Brazil. So if they're American cars sold in those countries, why can't we sell them here in the United States? Or why don't we sell them at a more accelerated rate? The other side of the equation is actually getting the alternative fuels produced like we're doing here in Washington State and get those facilities all over the country. And then I know that Detroit will be more aggressive on producing their alternative fuels. So we're very excited about a clean energy bill that mandates that production of alternative fuel cars, that gives an opportunity for us as a country to promote the uh, development of alternative fuels. In fact, the uh, WSU is, uh, has over in the Tri-Cities a uh, research facility with the Pacific Northwest Labs that is working just on that issue of alternative fuel and how to create what are the byproducts to biodiesel and plant-based ethanol so that, that we can actually get that produced. So we are leading the way. Now, why else is this such a, why else do I believe so passionately about this issue and a new energy strategy for the 21st century? The other issue is China. China is sitting there eating up about 25% of the new growth in energy consumption. 
And while we have benefited here lately of a drop in fuel prices, even if you talk to those in the energy markets or Goldman Sachs, they'll tell you that they expect oil prices to go back up. In fact, in Spokane, they're still paying the highest gas prices in the nation. They have a big question about why they're paying the highest gas prices in the nation. But we have a challenge to whether we're going to change the course in this process of being so dependent on fuel or not, of fossil fuel, or whether we're going to take an opportunity to not only lead our nation, but to make an investment overseas. Today, China accounts for about 40% of the increase in what is world oil demand. And if you look at just their growth, China is essentially adding one huge 1,000 megawatt coal-fired plant to the grid each week. That's how fast China is growing. So that's like adding enough capacity to serve the entire country of Spain. And they're adding that to their grid with what are really old coal-fired plant technology. In fact, 16 of the world's 20 most air polluted cities are in China. So they're using old technology to try to solve some of their problems. And so this patchwork of grid development that they are doing to me could be greatly enhanced by the technology that we're making right here in Washington State. So I have called on the administration to do a couple of things. First, hold a U.S.-China energy summit. Two, put at the at top of our agenda of a U.S.-China energy working group a cabinet level position for both us and China to work on the distribution of U.S. technologies into China. And three, help China step up to being a member of what is the International Energy Agency. This is an intergovernmental organization that helps work with 26 different nations on how to mitigate the issues of global supply shock for energy cost. And I think if we were working together, instead of having China constantly impact the price of fuel in the United States, we would be helping to solve some of the challenges that China has and the United States has by this very fact that we are just not endowed with the future oil reserves that will impact the price of what we are going to pay at the pumps as, as Americans. So I know that these sound like enormous challenges, but to me they sound like enormous opportunities. One of uh, my predecessors, Senator Warren Magnuson, went to China in 1959 and basically said, it's time to stop pretending that 700 million people in the world don't exist. And I thought that was a great statement by Senator Magnuson. To me, 47 years later, it's time that we get real. It's time that we come to understand both our challenges on energy policy and to understand the global energy needs of developing nations. And it's time to work together to have an opportunity for us to capitalize on this and to grow an, an energy strategy that will help our country be more profitable, be more environmentally secure, and certainly produce a better international foreign policy. Thank you very much for this opportunity today. Thank you very much, Senator Cantwell. We have some uh, time for questions and answers. Cindy and Laura have the wireless microphones. If you have a question, please raise your hand, get their attention, and uh, they will take your question. Let's start over here with Cindy. Thank you for being here and uh, for your service. You have on my television every night, uh, about four times an hour, a, a very negative ad about Mr. McGavick's service at Safeco. I'd be interested in how you personally feel about that ad and maybe more importantly how you feel about the whole subject of negative advertising that is uh, so inherent in our political process today. Well, he's referring to an ad that deals with, uh, my opponent ran a flight of ads dealing with the success of Safeco sometime in the middle of September. And while we in the United States have to make some tough budget decisions, I'm all about making tough decisions for companies and for enterprises. I worked at a company that basically you, uh, frankly, I took a job, I made half the salary I was used to making and put the rest into a hope and a future that that company would be successful and that I would be repaid with stock options 
for the future. So I'm all very aware about an investment in the future of a company and making hard decisions. But I think when you lay off 1,700 people and then take huge cash bonuses on top of salary and on top of stock options, I think that that's a different kind of choice. Now, this is important because when we go to Washington, D.C., we have some very big challenges that we have to make. We've gone from having a huge surplus to now having a huge deficit. And we're making choices about tax policy and investment in tax policy moving forward and about where we're going to tighten our budget. So I want to know where people's priorities are going to be. I'm not comfortable in giving a tax cut to the wealthiest 1% of Americans, at least at the level we did, those who made over $1.2 million, and then saying we're going to cut veterans' health care or we're going to cut opportunities for Pell Grants in education or to cut programs. So to me, it's about prioritizing those budgets. So I view that, I view that issue differently. I view those priorities differently. And to me, you have to communicate about what you think the budget priorities in tough economic times are going to be. So thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. That was thank terrific. You, that was thank terrific. You. You did a great job. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator. I'm grateful to you for uh, coming today. Thank you for having the courage to stand for election in these challenging times. In fact, what I'd like to do as we approach the election, I'd like to ask everybody here who's ever been a candidate for elected public office to please stand up. There are some brave people. Yeah. I, I like to tell people, this is a little bit glib, but I absolutely mean it. Uh, I've been shot at. Uh, that takes one kind of courage. Running for public office, I don't have that kind of courage. <laughs> and, I, and I mean that. I don't think there's a better example of service above self in this day and age than people that are willing to run for public office. So when you see somebody that has that kind of courage, please tell them thanks. Which brings us to this week's pretty good rule. It's a short one. Vote or keep quiet. <laughs> See you next week. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, now providing return to work services that help get absent employees back to their jobs. Healthy employees produce healthy companies at First Choice Health. And by Enterprise Seattle. For over 35 years, Enterprise Seattle has provided client-based economic development services to businesses throughout King County and its 39 cities. More information on Enterprise Seattle and how they help businesses grow and prosper can be found at www.enterpriseseattle.org.